All right, Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11, going to begin reading at verse 29. And in case you don't know, Hebrews 11 is a chapter that's really all about how people did great exploits through their faith in God. So Hebrews 11, 24 says, By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Now let's jump back to Acts chapter 7, Acts chapter 7 verse 17, and in this passage we have more of the story of Moses as told by Stephen. So starting in verse 17, Stephen says, But as the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased and multiplied in Egypt until there arose over Egypt another king who did not know Joseph. He dealt shrewdly with our race and forced our fathers to expose their infants so that they would not be kept alive. At this time, Moses was born, and he was beautiful in God's sight. He was brought up for three months in his father's house. And when he was exposed, Pharaoh's daughter adopted him and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was instructed in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was mighty in his words and deeds." When he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel. And seeing one of them being wronged, he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. Now when forty years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight, and as he drew near to look, there came the voice of the Lord. I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, and of Isaac, and of Jacob. Moses trembled and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take off the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their groaning, and I have come down to deliver them. And now, come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? This man God sent as both ruler and redeemer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. This man led them out, performing wonders and signs in Egypt and at the Red Sea, and in the wilderness for 40 years. My message today is entitled, God Can Use You to Lead Somebody Out. God can use you to lead somebody out. Let's pray, and let's invite God's blessing as we share the word this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus this morning, Lord, and we thank you for the gift of your word. It's truly the lamp for our feet, and it is the light for our pathway. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed. So, Lord, we give you our hearts. Lord, across these next few minutes, we ask that our hearts would be good soil, soil that can receive the seed of the word of God and bear fruit from it. Lord, you said that the words you speak to us, they are spirit and they are life. So would you send your spirit now and minister life to us out of the word? If you agree with that, would you say amen Amen. and amen? Well, for the last few weeks, we've been sharing stories of faith. We've been looking at some of the great heroes of the Bible and exploring the defining moments of faith in their lives. What can we learn from them and what encouragement can we receive from them? 
Pastor Glenn has shared how God makes us a promise, but then he leads us through a process, and sometimes it's quite a process. Throughout that process, God is teaching and he's stretching and remaking us. At the end of that process, we receive the fulfillment of the promise, and we see that God has been faithful to us. You know, when promises come to pass, we rejoice. How many of you know scripture says a desire fulfilled is like a tree of life? But we also rejoice because God uses that process to make us people of strong faith. We experience the biblical truth that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Right now at harvest time, we were in our own defining moment of faith. We're in a season where we believe that God is going to fulfill his promises to us. We've received many wonderful prophecies about our new building and the great harvest of souls that God wants to give us. Church, we have confidence because we've seen God's faithfulness throughout our history together from the beginnings of harvest time 35 years ago all the way up till now. And through faith and patience, We believe that we are about to inherit those promises. So we're asking you that you would just please uh, continue to stand with us in your prayers for phase two. And let's believe together for the fulfillment of every good thing that the Lord has said to us. So far in our sermon series, we've looked at several stories of faith. We've seen the faith of Abraham and then Isaac and Jacob. And last week, Pastor shared a great message about the life of Joseph. And today, we're looking at the faith of Moses. Moses was different from those other patriarchs. You know that Moses was mostly raised apart from God's people. Nevertheless, he had a very specific call upon his life, and he knew it. He believed God would deliver the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, and he believed that God would use him to do it. In order for that to happen, Moses was going to have to grow in faith. Moses had a lot to learn before he could become the deliverer. In fact, Moses had a lot to unlearn before he could be God's instrument to lead them out of slavery. He had a ways to go before he could reach anybody. Church, do you know that God wants to use each and every one of us to reach people for Christ and to set them free? I have a word for the servants of God this morning. And I don't just mean people that are in full-time ministry. I mean everyone here who wants to serve God. God wants you to know that every one of us who knows the Lord is filled with the riches of Christ. Even in our weakness, his word says that we carry a treasure in earthen vessels. It's the glory of Christ inside of our frail humanity. And even if we never stand in the spotlight the way Moses did, God can use us. And so it's our prayer that we would be useful to him. I think it's true of every believer. We all have someone in our lives that we would love to reach for Christ. Do you know what I'm talking about? Church, we all know people who need to be set free from the mess that they're in. I don't know about you, but have you noticed lately that it seems that people's messes are getting messier? We all have friends and loved ones who need to know the freedom of the children of God. They need to be born again, just like you and I needed to be. And we all know some people who need to be released from life-controlling addictions and habits. See, you may be able to sing, I once was lost, but now I'm found. But many people that we care about can't yet sing that along with you. In the Bible, Egypt is a picture of the world. It symbolizes mankind without God. It symbolizes people living in opposition to God and in opposition to his people. And you might have gone over your Red Sea. You might have left Egypt behind, but you still have some loved ones on the Egyptian side of the water, and they still need to cross over for themselves. 
Do we have faith today that God can reach them and deliver them? And do we believe that God can use us to lead somebody out of Egypt? Church, I believe God wants to use every one of us to reach people for his kingdom and help them to get set free. Just like Moses, each one of us has a call to be a deliverer, to help someone pass over from death to life in Christ. Church, you are carrying the answer for somebody. I want you to tell your neighbor, God can use you to lead somebody out. All right, that sounded pretty convincing. <laughs> we're we're going to get there, just like Moses. How did Moses become a deliverer? And how can we become more useful in God's kingdom, someone that God can truly use to lead people out? Looking at Moses' life, I see three principles of faith that help to make him a deliverer, and I want to share them with you. Three principles of faith, and the first one is this. Faith teaches us there are things we must refuse. Faith teaches us there are things we must refuse. You like that, huh? We have no Bible evidence that Moses ever told Pharaoh to talk to the hand, but it, it could have happened. Church, if Moses was ever going to lead people out of Egypt, he was first going to have to leave the palace for himself. Raised as a prince, he had a decision to make. He would need to renounce his Egyptian life. He would need to walk away from it all, believing that God had a better purpose for his life. He believed that God wanted to set people free and that God would use him to do it. In Hebrews 11.24, we read this. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, uh, literally it says great, when he was great, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. By the time he reached the age of 40, Moses had experienced an awakening. He realized that he needed to identify with his own people who were suffering under Pharaoh's whip. So no matter how crazy his Egyptian friends must have thought he had become, Moses no longer cared to be known as the grandson of Pharaoh, possibly even a future Pharaoh himself. He decided that he would care for the burdens of his people and leave the palace behind. In the scriptures that we read this morning, we saw several times that Moses did some great exploits through faith. But what did that faith consist of? What exactly did Moses believe and where was he placing his hope? The answer is actually simple. It's just not really found in the verses that we read. You see, Moses, like many other Israelites, knew that deliverance was coming. Moses believed that without having any dreams or signs from God because he had God's clear word of promise. You see, centuries earlier, Joseph had told his brothers, God will visit you and he will bring you up out of this land into the land that he swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In fact, Joseph wasn't the only one to receive that revelation. Before Joseph's time, God had promised the very same thing to Isaac and to Jacob. That simple prophecy passed down from one generation to the next. It gave Moses faith to leave the palace. It fueled his desire to participate in what God was doing instead of being captivated by what Egypt could afford him. Moses believed that deliverance was coming, and so he was able to leave the crown of Egypt on the ground. As Christians, you and I can do the same. We also have a promise of deliverance, deliverance from this world. And if we understand that this world is just our temporary home, then we also can refuse Egypt. And you know, when we do, it'll make us more effective agents of God's kingdom. Paul tells us that no soldier in God's kingdom can afford to get overly entangled in the things of this life. Eventually, Moses refused to even be called 
the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Don't call me that anymore. He dropped his membership in the royal family so there could be no turning back. See, he didn't even wait to get banished for siding with some slaves. He banished himself. Now, church, let's, let's forget, if we can, what Hollywood has taught us about this story. And I know it's, I know it's difficult because we've all seen the movies, right? But everyone knew that Moses was Hebrew. He was nursed by his own birth mother, probably until he was three or four years old. That's how they did it. So he would have spoken Hebrew. He also would have looked different from the other princes with different features and different skin color. You know, the Egyptians painted themselves as reddish brown. But they drew people from Canaan, like Moses' people, as lighter. They drew them as white or yellow is how they drew them. And despite this, the Egyptians seemed to have embraced him as a grandson of Pharaoh, probably due to his mother's political power. And so Moses was embraced. He was instructed in all of their wisdom. And he enjoyed great success as an Egyptian royal. Many people have thought that Moses was a lifelong stutterer, but that's not the case. Stephen says he was mighty in his words. Stephen also called him mighty in his deeds. You know, Josephus, the Jewish historian, said that Moses was the commanding general that commanded the Egyptian armies that conquered Ethiopia. It gave him tremendous fame, and it also gave him his Ethiopian wife. Now, we don't know if that's all true, and yet the Bible says, listen, the Bible says he was mighty in deeds while he was still an Egyptian. But God's word of promise led him to refuse his fame. See, worldly wisdom would have said to him, Moses, you have to value the power, the perks, uh, the, the leverage that you have that comes from being a prince. Think of all the good that you could do for your people from inside the palace. But faith taught him that that would ultimately be empty and unfulfilling. Faith also taught him to say no to the pleasures of being a prince. How many of you know that a grandson of Pharaoh probably would get to enjoy whatever pleasures he wanted to, but Moses spurned all of that. His birthright had been a life of luxury, no doubt, with servants at his beck and call, but now he cut himself off from that life. What an example for you and me. You know, at different points in our Christian walk, God will bring us to just such defining moments of faith. Faith is teaching you and me like it taught Moses that if we want to go deeper into our destiny with God, somebody's got to get this, if we want to go deeper into our destiny with God, if we want God to use us to be able to bring some hope to other people, then there are some things we will have to refuse. Pleasures of sin, the intoxication of fame, the lust for power. These are things that Moses, like every Christian, needs to walk away from. Seems that some Christians today may want to be a child of God and a prince of Egypt at the same time, but it's never been successfully done. And like Moses, when Egypt offers me its crown, I need to walk away and let it tumble to the earth. Instead, I need to seek the kingdom of God because Jesus said that when I do that, everything that I really need will just be added unto me by my heavenly Father. Faith teaches us there are things we must refuse. We're talking about principles of faith that help Moses become a deliverer. First, faith teaches us there are things we must refuse. And second, faith teaches us there are things we need to choose. Moses learned there were things to refuse and things to choose. Faith teaches all of us not just to refuse something, but to embrace something. Both can be difficult, but both are worth it. Yeah. Hebrews 11.25 says, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And it also says that he greatly valued the reproach of Christ. That means that he valued the disgrace 
of following the Lord. Because Moses believed that God would deliver them, he was willing to fully identify himself with worshipers of Israel's God. Now you need to know, if you don't know, that the Egyptians saw the Hebrews as total outcasts. They looked upon the worship of Yahweh as an abomination. So much so that they would not even allow the Hebrews to worship God and offer their sacrifices inside the boundaries of Egypt. Imagine that. But Moses, hear me, church here, Moses was not embarrassed by the worship of God or by God's family. He wanted to be with them. He wanted to pray and sing and worship with them. And so the mockery of the sophisticated people, the sophisticated Egyptians, no longer affected him and no longer bothered him. They had their dozens of strange and weird and immoral gods, but he delighted in the pure worship of the God of Abraham. For Moses, embracing the scorn that came with being a worshiper of Yahweh was now a treasure greater than all of Egypt's riches. What a lesson for us. You see, if my father is promising to take me out of Egypt and bring me into my inheritance, then I should embrace the worship of God and embrace the house of God. Hope somebody grabs a hold of that today. Preaching to the choir because you're here. But see, in our hearts, I need to do what King David would say to do later on and kiss the son instead of being ashamed of him. Later on in Hebrews, the writers say in Hebrews 13 that as believers in Christ, we've been called to bear his reproach because here we have no continuing city, but we are looking for the city that's coming. Church, be like Moses. Don't just refuse Egypt, but embrace Christ. Be willing to stand for him and embrace the insults that come your way for his sake and the sake of the gospel. Moses also chose to identify with the people of God. So instead of being counted among the oppressors, he developed a heart for the oppressed. Stephen tells us, listen, Stephen says, it came into his heart to visit his brothers. In Exodus chapter 2, back where we get the whole story of Moses, it tells us how he went on to them. And the scripture says he looked on their burdens. He developed compassion for them. He chose to take on their reproach. He would share in their poor treatment. Moses must have felt the blood rising in his cheeks his entire life, hearing Egyptians making comments about those people those Hebrews, and now he embraced those ethnic slurs. And in choosing to be mistreated with the people of God, Moses was actually in a beautiful way. He was revealing the heart of the Father. We read more about the Exodus in Isaiah 63, and it tells us a beautiful truth about the heart of our Father God. It says that in all of their affliction, he was afflicted. Moses chose to identify with them by using his Hebrew name. Can we get a little deep here for a second? Did you have any protein this morning? You know, because sometimes the oatmeal just doesn't have enough, right? You have a little piece of egg, a little piece of sausage, all right? So go deep with me here for one second. Moses chose to identify with them by using his Hebrew name. Now, his Egyptian name of Moses, it does mean drawn out because he was drawn out of the water. But it also, that word just means a son or a child. And so there were lots of pharaohs. They had names like Thut Moses and Ka Moses and Ah Moses. It just meant the son of Tut or whoever. And there were many similar names that the Egyptians had. And some Egyptian people were just simply called plain old Moses. So the Egyptians called him Moses, a child. And so they probably just thought of him as a son. He's another son of the Nile. But they probably never thought about the deeper meaning of his name, the meaning that revealed his true identity. Now in the Hebrew Bible, see, he is only called by his Hebrew name of Moshe. 
And that name not only means that he was drawn out, but it also sounds just like the Hebrew word for Savior, Deliverer. So by now choosing to be known by his Hebrew name, Moses was saying, no, I won't be counted anymore as a son of Egypt. Instead, I want to be known as the one that God miraculously saved out of the water so that I could deliver his people. And if we wish to be known as the servant of the Lord the way Moses was known, if we wish to be greatly used of God like Moses was, then just like Moses, you and I can no longer identify with the world. Instead, we ought to identify with Christ and his people. May we never be embarrassed to be called a follower of Christ. Jesus said, blessed are you when you are persecuted for my name's sake. Embrace the reproach of being a Christian. Don't be hungry for friendship with the world. Embrace the scorn that has always followed God's people. It's never been popular to be a follower of God. Moses walked away from so much more than we will ever walk away from in order to embrace that reproach. Just like Moses did, Church, you wear your real name proudly. Remind yourself of who you really are. Don't see yourself with that name of just, just one more. I'm just one more generic child of the world. But you choose to see yourself instead as somebody that God miraculously saved. Think about who you were before you knew him. See, he pulled you out like Moses and he saved you so that you could help others get free also. What do we learn from Moses' choices? If God promised Moses that he would soon deliver his people, then by faith in that promise, Moses must not only say no to the temporary things, he must say yes to the purposes of God. He must fully align himself with what God is doing. And as a friend of mine likes to say, that's good preaching. So. We're talking about principles of faith that help Moses become a deliverer. First, faith teaches us there are things we must refuse. Second, faith says there are things we need to choose. And finally this, faith teaches us to work for what we can't lose. In Hebrews 11:26, we read that Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt. Why? It says, because he was looking to the reward. Moses could wear the reproach of Christ because he was looking for rewards that Egypt could not give him. He had faith to leave the palace and embrace that persecution because now he was seeking true and lasting riches. We know that Moses lived in Old Testament times, but he understood a New Testament truth that faithful saints are promised to receive a crown that doesn't fade away. Can you imagine Moses must have said, I've been pampered long enough. Now I'll spend the rest of my time helping others to get to where God wants to bring them. They've been promised a land flowing with milk and honey, and that's the inheritance. That's the reward that I'm looking forward to. Just like Moses, let's no longer seek to feed on the fickle applause of men. You're up one day, you're down the next. Instead, we should live to hear our master's voice one day saying, well done, you good and you faithful servant, enter into the joy of your Lord. And Moses knew what it was to receive the acclaim of Pharaoh, but now it was the promise of God's reward that was keeping him going for the long haul. He endured many trials. How? In the same way that you and I can, by fixing our eyes on what's waiting for us. Paul would later tell us in 2 Corinthians 4 that our light affliction, which is only for a moment, is working, is producing for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. When we labor with such a hope, it's so much easier to work for God, to sacrifice for his purposes, 
and to serve others, to help others get to where they need to go. Now, of course, you and I, we've read Moses' life, we've seen all the movies, and so we know that things were a little rocky at the beginning. We're not perfect either, and we'll probably make all the same mistakes that Moses did. But as he grew in faith, so can we. First, the Bible tells us in Hebrews 11 that by faith, Moses forsook Egypt. He left. Moses had to learn about the presence of God. Moses had tried to deliver Israel in his own strength. Back in Acts chapter 7, Stephen tells us he supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation, listen, by his hand. But they did not understand. Stephen doesn't elaborate on that, but maybe Moses was planning or hoping for some kind of mass uprising. See, Moses had left the palace just then, but he was still carrying the ways of the palace in his heart. Willfulness, violence, cunning. Those were the things that had made empires like Egypt powerful. But church, God will not bring deliverance to his people with a sword. He would do it with a shepherd's rod, the symbol of wise and compassionate leadership. So God ended up sending Moses to school for 40 years. You think your student loans are bad. God ended up sending Moses to school for 40 years until he received his degree, his BD degree. In case you're not familiar with that particular degree, it stands for backside of the desert. <laughs> and in that wilderness, God would teach a pampered prince how to lead his people like a shepherd instead of like a warrior. So God would meet him at that burning bush and tell him, I have come down. To deliver them. So Moses would learn to move out at God's command instead of trying to force things to happen. He gave up on delivering people through the strength of the flesh or trying to save people through Egyptian methods. He left Egypt by faith, and that means more than just trusting God for his personal protection. It also means that he left and learned to trust that God could deliver him with him or without him. He had to learn that, guess what? Did you know that God could do some things all by himself? And so he believed God's promise of deliverance, but now he would learn to adjust his ideas maybe about his own role in the process. Moses started out thinking he was helping God, but he learned that he really needed God to help him. Eventually, he ended up naming one of his sons Eliezer, which means God is my helper. He endured, it says, as though he could see the invisible one, as though by faith he could see what God was doing and how God was working, even when it didn't seem like God was doing very much. I think somebody needs to lay a hold of that one today. He had to leave Egypt and get out into God's presence where he could really hear God's voice and where he could receive a true commissioning from God. He had to trust God to prepare the people's hearts for deliverance. After all, on his way out the door out of Egypt, the last thing he remembered seeing in Egypt was his own people beating each other up. In all those things, Moses was learning to have faith in God's presence, instead of faith in his own strength. And church, whenever we feel as though we have failed, as though we've stumbled in our Christian walk, whenever we've tried to reach people and blown it, like Moses did, let's get into God's presence once again and hear him speak. Let's dare to believe that God can deliver the people that we care about. But believe that it's not by your might, not by your power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The Bible also tells us that by faith, Moses kept the Passover and he sprinkled the blood. Moses had to learn about the priorities of God. Now Moses had a tremendous sense of justice. He defended the Israelites and he later on defended the daughters of Jethro. But Moses here experienced a shift in his priorities. 
Moses learned that political justice came behind being right with God and being in relationship with God. Moses had to learn that living under God was the foundation stone of justice for God's people. And he became known for God's law more than anything else. By faith, Moses obeyed God's instructions to keep the Passover. Now listen, church, no doubt there were some Israelites that were offended at the thought of being known for the smearing of blood on their homes. You real estate agents here know that that's usually not a big selling point. <laughs> but Moses learned that that blood was the only way to avoid death and escape from Egypt. Neither can we avoid judgment and escape the world without the blood. It's the same for us today. Can I be unpopular for a minute? In fact, without the message of the blood, without the message of Christ crucified, the church has no reason to even exist. I want you to think about this with me. Without the cross, the church is only a morals club. Without his blood, the church has nothing to say that couldn't also be said by the social services department or the YMCA. The Passover taught Moses that sin was more of a killer than any Egyptian taskmaster. And so he wasn't ashamed to proclaim the message of the blood, that the blood would save them from judgment and that it must be applied to every door. Church, in this way, Moses had to learn about the priorities of God. Now listen, of course we work for the help and the betterment of people and society as a whole. Of course we do works of mercy all around here and all around the world. You know that. But the church must hold forth the gospel message as its first priority. Don't be ashamed of the message of the cross. Don't be embarrassed to talk about the blood of Jesus and to present it to people as God's priority because it is God's provision for people's salvation. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. By faith, Moses sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer might not touch them. Don't be ashamed to tell somebody that you care about that salvation can be theirs through the shed blood of Christ. Finally, the Bible tells us that by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea. Moses had learned about the power of God. I think Moses grew in his faith until his faith became contagious. Notice that the Bible doesn't say Moses crossed the Red Sea, but it says by faith, the people crossed as if it were dry land. See, once the Israelites trusted in that blood together with him, it was no longer just Moses alone who was ready to leave. The entire nation had become a nation of faith, a nation that could leave Egypt. And by faith in the power of God, they could all cross the boundary from death to life, slavery to freedom, not just Moses. Worship team, you can come back, please, if you would. And so, church, I want to challenge you this morning. Moses knew what God had called him to do. And who he was did not match up with who God called him to be. And so he had reached a defining moment of faith. Who would Moses be? Who would he decide to become? Moses decided to step out, looking for God's reward instead of Pharaoh's. He trusted God to deliver his people, and that's our challenge also. How many of you know there are so many people that God would love to rescue through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ? We can help them come to know him. We can reach out to them again in boldness and faith, and we can see them saved and we can see that beautiful new building become filled to overflowing with precious new souls.
Moses' simple faith fashioned him into the deliverer that he was meant to be. Are we willing to step forward in faith and say like Moses, yes, I will refuse what I ought to refuse so that I can be free from the pull of the world. Can we say, yes, I will choose the better portion so that I can be more effective, so that I can flow in compassion for the lost. Can we say, yes, I will work for a heavenly reward, a reward that inspires me to keep going for the long haul. If we do those things, then just like Moses, I believe we'll begin to experience the presence of God coming to us in a new way. We'll begin to grow in wisdom as we understand the priorities of God. And we'll experience the power of God and we'll see people crossing over from death to life. Church, if we do these things and if we get the heart of God for people who need to be rescued by him, then I know that God can use us to lead somebody out. Will you stand together with me? Let's give some praise to Jesus in his house this morning.